morning, everybody. And um, thank you for that very kind introduction, Simon. Um, I think, as we said, actually, you should be congratulated for all your sort of groundbreaking ideas as well, from the you know the Freedom Festival to I think the Better Off Out campaign before people were talking about that to you know, even having on your bio how you want to you want to buy your pint. How about that? <laughs> These are great ideas as well. And, you know, good morning to you all. Good morning to our friends from the UK and Cut as well. I hope you've enjoyed the, um, this presentation. Um, I'm very honoured to be given the first, uh, giving the first um, State of the Movement address. And um, I just really not sort of format to go for, I thought I'd go for a bit of a powerful with a few slides. And the next one was meant to have music if you flick to it. So it doesn't actually work without music, but if you flick again. The first State of the Mu Movement um, address at the Freedom Festival. So, uh, next slide. What do we mean by the um, Conservative Movement? Well, you know, the first part consists of all the people you know, in this room, all the different groups um, represented here. So everybody from the um, Freedom Association, to the IEA, to the Young Foundation, to TPA, all the different um, campaign groups, uh, think tanks, um, that make up the sort of Conservative Movement. It also consists of um, different political parties as well. And one of the things I'll talk about later on is um, you know, the split between UKIP and the Conservative Party. But it's not just um, the UKIP and the Conservative Party. I would say there are people in other political parties too who I would consider to be part of the sort of wider Conservative movement. People who are perhaps, um, as they used to be called, Orange Book Liberals, people in the um, Labour Party, like sort of Kate Hoey, um, yeah. or Frank Veal, people like that, who I would say are basically um, you know, sound people you know, on our side. I think one thing that's worth remembering is that um, even if we sort of see ourselves as being um, a movement, we shouldn't be too um, exclusive. We should always try and reach uh, beyond the aisle, if we can get inside. And um, you know, this week, of course, we had this sad um, passing of uh, Tony Benn. And you know, Tony Benn, as I don't know if Alex is up yet, Alex Steve. He's there. Are they up? <laughs> he was at the launch of Big Brother Watch, wasn't he? Um, five years ago, and wrote a forward to Alex's book on uh, civil liberties. He was always very sound on uh, the European cause as well, uh, being one of the early people to talk about how we should have a different relationship um, with the EU. Leaving the EU. So I just remember that we should always try and build alliances with the other side as well, rather than just being in you know, looking, even though uh, there's some people who I can't really think I'd build alliances with. Not like us. I don't think what's good on Europe, I think. <laughs> Go on the next slide. Um, I want to talk about sort of three areas in this um, presentation. I'm um, very optimistic about the strength of the uh, Conservative movement at the moment. Um, so I want to talk a lot about that in the first section, and talk about how this has actually led to us um, shifting the uh, agenda as well in politics, but then address a few of the uh, problems that we have as a movement overall. So if we um, talk about the first section first, which is how basically the right uh, remains strong. I think the, the, the strength of the Conservative movement is probably as strong as it ever has been. And when I say that, I look at um, different polling which I'll go through, um, the number of um, groups on the centre-right, the number of um, activists who are active at the grassroots on the centre-right, um, our dominance in um, getting our message out in the media and on the internet, and also the fact that we're trusted on the key issues. I'll run through all of those in turn. So what we have here is basically um, the YouGov uh, tracker poll going back to April uh, 2012. And the reason I picked that date is because it was the first time when uh, YouGov started having um, UKIP on their um, regular tracker poll, so we can actually see the UKIP numbers as well. Now, looking at that, you may be slightly disheartened and wonder what on earth I'm going on about when I talk about the strength of the uh, Conservative movement. Of course, the Conservative Party are still quite considerably behind um, the Labour Party in the polls. Though it must be said they're actually getting slightly um, closer in, uh, close to Labour. But if you um, combine 
uh, both the right and the left, if you combine the UKIP and the Conservative numbers and the Labour and the Liberal Democrat numbers, you can see quite a different picture where it's much um, narrower. Now, obviously, the blue line, the centre-right line, if you like, is still you know, behind Labour. But things are narrowing, and if you put in a trend line to that, you can very much see the <coughs> direction of travel. If you actually carry the graph on a little bit more, it would actually cross over when it comes to the um, general election. But of course, this is one of the issues I'll talk about later on, where we talk about the sort of split in the centre-right <coughs> electorally between the Conservatives and UK, but that's one of the issues I think we need to um, address. And um, before some people say we should have had the uh, AV system, perhaps yeah. this really to come and see John in the front row there. Um, I would actually say we shouldn't have gone down that route. It may have helped us with perhaps sort of one general election, but movement towards proportional representation, I would argue, wouldn't have been good for uh, either the Conservative Concern Party or for the country as a whole. Now, the right remains strong. There are lots of um, centre-right groups. Now, if we go back to uh, 1975, um, there are actually very few groups on the uh, centre-right. Um, Freedom Association, um, the Bow Group are around, uh, the CPS, I think, had just launched in 1975, uh, the IA had been around for 25, 20 years by that point, uh, the Selsgrove Group were around. But that's still really only sort of five groups on the um, centre right. <coughs> now, if you fast forward to uh, today, there's a whole myriad of uh, campaign groups and think tanks who are broadly on the um, centre right of uh, politics. Now, just to be clear, I wouldn't say for one moment that these groups you know, support the Conservative Party or support UKIP. I think it's fair to say that the groups on the screen there. Um, have some of the principles which I would describe as being on the uh, centre-right of politics. So you can see a vast uh, increase in the number of groups. And I actually uh, mapped that out by counting up the number of groups for each of the years in the past um, 30 years. We actually see a huge growth in the number of groups, basically from 1997 when the uh, Conservative Party uh, left office. More and more groups have been launched every year, not just by me, by lots of other people <laughs> as, um, as well. So we've never been stronger when it comes to the number of centre-right groups. Now, it looks like, if you look at the number of um, activists, you may think, you know, what on earth, on earth am I going on about saying that we're strong in terms of activists when the Conservative base has just collapsed in uh, huge terms? Going back to the 1950s, of course, when the Conservative Party had uh, three million members. Now in a situation where um, the Conservative Party, I think the figure they claimed over the summer was 134,000 members. Some people are now saying that it's actually below uh, six figures, I think if you look at it properly. So a huge collapse in the number of people yeah, who actually signed up to the Conservative Party. So how does I make the case that as an activist base we're uh, gaining strength? If we click on the next slide, I think it's worth pointing out that a bit like in the uh, US, we're starting to have more um, third party groups who have uh, strong activist bases. Now, there are certain sort of definitional things here in terms of what you count as being an activist or a supporter. Is it somebody who has simply signed up through the internet? Is it somebody who has actually given money to the cause? Is it somebody who's taken part in some form of uh, grassroots activity? There are all sorts of definitional things which will vary between the the groups there. But I'm pretty impressed that um, the People's Pledge, um, in a very short space of time, managed to get 150,000 people signed up to the campaign. I think without the work of um, the People's Pledge and other groups as well, or without that work, we wouldn't have actually seen the uh, David Cameron's uh, Bloomberg speech and his commitment to an in-out uh, referendum. So it just, it just shows these groups can actually have a big impact from the outside of traditional uh, party politics. If we have the next slide. I would also say that we're good at um, getting our message out. Now, this actually shows the, uh, the number of readers for the uh, broadsheet uh, newspapers. Now, you can actually see the huge collapse in the number of people who are actually buying newspapers. That's one of the themes which 
I think we all have to grapple with that the traditional means of getting our message out through uh, the print media is very fast going away. But it must be said that the two newspapers at the top, um, the Telegraph and the Times, you are know, still broadly on the centre right. Uh, the Guardian has dropped away uh, hugely, that's the bottom, the bottom line, the purple line. So I'd say, broadly speaking, with the broadsheets, you know, we're still in a fairly uh, decent position. If you flip on one. With the tabloids as well, uh, the two newspapers at the top, even though the numbers of subscribers has gone down, I uh, still so worth saying that the Sun and the Daily Mail are still the two top newspapers and two which are still broadly on the centre right. And actually, um, of course, lots of people get their news now via the um, internet. I think it's worth talking about the strength of uh, Mail Online, which is the, I think, the most um, widely read newspaper website in the world now. And uh, Einstein gets um, 8.2 million hits um, every day, which compared to uh, 4.7 million hits for um, The Guardian in the UK, um, is uh, substantially more. So again, a centre-right source of news you know, beating a centre-left source of news. And it's also worth pointing out that um, you know, smaller websites like uh, The Spectator Coffee House, which is a great read, I recommend you read it, that hit uh, a million unique visitors for the first time last October, so another good source of news. Now if we look at the, uh, the blogs, what have you, um, it's worth saying that the Guido Fawkes website has, I'd say, the, the highest ranking. The Alexa rankings are a good way of actually measuring the uh, impacts and impact and popularity of different uh, websites. That's uh, ranked the highest, compared to Political Scrapbook, which is way down at 7,850. And even if you look at the more sort of cerebral um, uh, websites like Conservative Home or like Labourless, again you can see uh, Conservative Home having an extra ranking of uh, 10,500 and Labourless being way down at 17,800. So again, if you compare like for like, you know, left for right, similar types of websites, I would say the ones on the centre right are having more of an impact, are getting more hits than those on the centre left. So the fourth area why we remain strong, I would say we're trusted on the on two of the top um, key issues. If you you go ask a question every day, what issues are most important to you? And um, you know, consistently the three issues are basically uh, the economy, um, immigration, and healthcare. Uh, with the economy getting about 61 percent, people think it, people think it's a very important issue. Um, asylum and immigration about 51 percent, and the NHS about 31 percent. And you can see in two of those, in the economy and on immigration, uh, the Conservative Party are polling ahead of the Labour Party, more trusted on those issues than the Labour Party. So two of the top three issues, the centre right is more trusted than the left. Now, Connor was talking about uh, Margaret Thatcher quite rightly last night in his uh, <coughs> speech. And he remembered her final speech, I think it must have been in one of his constituencies, where she said that the greatest achievement that she had was actually uh, Blair and what Tony Blair did with um, New Labour. And I would actually say that we're continuing to have a big impact when it comes to um, the ideas on the uh, centre left. I would say that the centre-right is having the big ideas in politics at the moment. And I would say that increasingly, the Labour Party is starting to um, accept our ideas. I'll just talk about these two issues briefly. So why do we have the big ideas? I think it's fair to say that um, the work of um, Michael Gove in education, with the introduction of um, free schools, the expansion of the academies programme, um, the sort of reorganisation of exams, exam system to make it more rigorous again. Those are good examples of how you know, he has really set the agenda. I think he made some quite significant progress in that area. Um, on welfare, uh, the work of Ian W. Smith with um, Universal Credit. Again, I think um, a good example of the right having a big impact when it comes to uh, policy. And then I got to go down to a much smaller issue, which one I think is very important, on spending transparency, this is particularly close to our hearts at the TPA. We're a big believer that going forward, if you're going to keep a check on government spending, the best way to do that is to actually have transparency. So taxpayers, journalists, groups like the TPA, um, we can actually see 
um, how their money is being spent. So there's three key areas. I would say that we've had some big ideas, and we've been able to actually implement uh, those ideas. Now, when I was preparing for this little presentation, um, I was reading uh, a magazine, I came across this quote, I thought it neatly illustrated actually how uh, we're having the, a big impact on ideas. Um, I thought I should read that very quickly. Yeah, Mr. Goh's opponents, especially the teaching unions, wish to portray him as a zealot. Yet one is in no doubt what he, set, where, what he stands for and what he wants. He can be wrong-headed, but he has the courage and his, of his convictions. Could one say the same of the shadow education secretary? Now if you flip to show the source of that, that was actually an editorial in the New Statesman magazine. So even the New Statesman, a magazine on the centre-left, actually acknowledges that Michael Gove is having a huge impact and is going in the right direction. And I would say that in response to um, a lot of the plans put forward by the government, um, I think it's fair to say that the Labour Party is now accepting these reforms. Now, I wish a lot of these reforms would go a lot further. Uh, but the fact that the Labour Party is caught up and is accepting them and saying it's not going to change them, I think is quite significant. So, uh, Trisha Hunt has accepted uh, Michael Gove's reforms for education. Um, on the European issue, I think it's quite significant this week, the Labour Party said that if there's a uh, treaty change, and if there's a transfer of powers from the UK to the EU, it will definitely hold an in out referendum, and that is likely to happen in the next five years. So, even though they didn't commit to a referendum, I can still actually see that happening. On welfare, accepting universal credit. I'm not quite sure about Ed Balls, but uh, he's making some of the right noise about um, budget deficits and controlling spending, but I must say I don't quite believe him yet. <laughs> but you can say the language is definitely changing in that area. Now I wanted to show you uh, a video clip here, which unfortunately didn't quite work on my uh, memory stick. But I hope you've all uh, watched the fantastic documentary from uh, Martin Durkin. Uh, Death of a Revolutionary. And the clip I wanted to show you there was one which I remember Mark telling me about in the pub before it actually went out, where um, Neil Kinnock is asked by Martin Durkin um, if he'd reverse any of the changes that um, Thatcher made. And he basically paused for a very long time and then basically said no, he accepted the Thatcherite consensus. And I would say that the Labour Party, even though in rhetorical terms there are things to be beware of, uh, with Ed Miliband, it still basically accepts that uh, consensus the move on. So what are the big um, problems um, facing the right? There's still huge uh, policy uh, battles to win, and I'll talk uh, a little bit more about those in a second. Uh, so we're behind the polls, and uh, we're divided in an electoral sense. But I would say the main problems on the right are coming from, I would say, the Conservative Party rather than the movement um, as a whole. So the big policy battles to win. Of course we still have the uh, government's ongoing support for HS2, which I think is a good indicator that they're on the, uh, the wrong track. Um, the deficit remains far too high, of course. Um, and if, uh, I think all the parties need to actually really seriously address the you know, spending cuts, not just paying lip service to it, but actually severe, you know, really cutting back on spending. That's why it's so good the, the TPA are now doing their war of waste, which they'll have some very exciting ideas on how to cut spending. Um, there's still a certain vagueness on the um, European issue when it comes to uh, the Conservative Party, you know, where David Cameron's red lines will be in the negotiation. Uh, I think it's best to say there's a bit of vagueness there. And of course, on the environmental policy, I still think that we've got lots of measures in place, which, um, you know, from the green agenda, which was very popular sort of 10 or 15 years ago, which are really destroying jobs and holding yeah, yeah, back. So there's some big policy areas still to win. And of course, like I was saying before, we're still uh, behind in the polls, so that's a huge you know, problem uh, for the right. It's still a problem that because we didn't have any boundary change, boundary changes, um, you know, the fact is the Conservative Party need to poll way ahead of the Labour Party. I think by 11 points ahead of the Labour Party to actually get an overall majority, compared to the Labour Party needing a three-point lead to actually get a majority. That's a huge imbalance thanks to the fact we didn't get uh, boundary changes. And of course, the Labour Party is, um, is pursuing their strategy of getting um, 35% of the polls, and with 35%, they can actually win. If they know, if they can convince 
the million voters who left them between 2005 and 2010, they can actually get back into power with a uh, majority. So sometimes when they come out with policies which people say, oh, that's an appeal to the whole of the electorate, why on earth they do that? I actually believe that those policies and tests that very thoroughly to appeal to that one million voters they need to actually get back on track. And the, the third issue, um, we divide on the centre-right. We're in the same position that the centre-left was in the 1980s, where you had the breakaway um, SDP uh, party. And of course, that's a huge issue for us. I believe we can't get into government again with a majority for the centre-right until that split between the UK and the Conservatives is um, healed. And it's very interesting. I think we hear from Toby Young, is that right? Later on this That's weekend, great, yes, yes. with his big project about Unite the Right. I'm looking forward to hearing that, yeah. what he has to say about that. But that remains a huge, huge problem for us. Final <coughs> thought, a bit more of an optimistic note, I hope. Um, I think as a movement, we face um, some good opportunities over the next um, 18 months to actually influence um, policy on the right. And uh, so I, th I believe as a movement, we're in a you know, win, win, win. <coughs> Uh, situation. The first opportunity is obviously influencing the uh, manifestos when it comes to the uh, general election. And I would urge you know, all the groups to actually really properly engage with the, uh, the policy process uh, with that. Um, I think sometimes groups can be too timid <coughs> in putting forward their, uh, yeah, their pamphlets and their ideas into the policy making uh, process. Um, I would urge you to actually you know, submit your ideas. And, and then they can't ignore them. You know, um, they can't say they never actually heard, heard about the pamphlet you wrote or that article you wrote. Make sure the ideas are actually getting in there. So we should try and influence the manifesto. That's really important over the next uh, six months in particular. Then, of course, we should be thinking about uh, the possibility of another coalition agreement after the um, election and trying to influence the terms of that. I think it's much tougher for. Uh, David Cameron this time round to actually just railroad a coalition agreement through the uh, Conservative Party. And I think we should be thinking about the red lines in that coalition agreement. I believe he said that um, having an in-app referendum is going to be one of those red lines. But we should make sure we hold him to that, but also define what the other red lines should be. Because if that coalition agreement has to get through the MPs, or possibly even has to get through the Conservative Party as a whole. Yeah. That's, a, that's a position of uh, influence for us. And then if we're not in a situation where we um, uh, negotiate a coalition agreement, um, we may be in a situation where a leadership election comes up after the next election. I'm not saying this will happen, but we could be in that situation. So again, that's another point at which I think we've all got to be thinking about. You know, how can we influence that, that process? What can we be doing now to make sure that the potential leadership candidates in that election are getting all the material we put out. So when they do speeches, and we can see we're doing a sort of shadow war game at the moment between the different leadership contenders, when they make speech on general issues, they're reflecting some of the things that we um, as a movement talk about. So like I say, there are three opportunities I believe for us to influence things, but I would urge you to concentrate on the, the first two rather than the third this weekend. There we go. Yeah.